Good morning to all, and thank you for connecting with us this morning. Uh, we're going to do our presentation in English since we have an international audience today in our, in our panel. Um, we are the Tijuana ADC, and today we will be talking about our TV industry. And as, as we're going to discuss specifically our panel industry, our display panel industry, or our display industry, sorry, of Baja and specifically Tijuana. I want to present our panelists that are going to be with us today. Firstly, we're going to start talking uh, with Helen Wang. Helen is the CEO of W Consulting Group, Vice Chair of the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation, ex-Google, ex-Apple executive. She helps to build bridges between the Silicon Valley and the supply chain companies worldwide through value chain strategy and supply chain collaboration. Helen, thank you for being with us. Then we go to Marco Esponda. Marco is the vice president for Hisense. He has more than 22 years of experience in the human resource management and manufacturing operation organizations. He works ext extensively with Asia-based leadership and manufacturing plants in Mexico to facilitate teamwork and improve communication. Marco, thank you for being with us. A pleasure, Carlos, to join this group. Iram Monsivais, he's also with us, former vice president and industry consultant uh, for Samsung. His extensive experience has been managing Oriental and Japanese companies such as Hitacho, Hitachi, Sanyo, and Samsung. He's a partner and CEO and founder of his company, Synergy Asociados SC, as a consulting company for leadership and innovation in productivity and quality. Also, we have a- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, good morning. Good morning. Then we have Edgardo Blanchet, Vice President for Foxconn. As Vice President of Operations, he holds a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Universidad Panamericana and a master's degree in industrial management and engineer, in engineering from Texas A&M. His expertise has led him to receive awards in Mexico and the United States such as the 2020 Tijuana San Diego Regional Leaders Award and Mexico's National Logistics Award, among others. Welcome, Edgardo, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. And finally, uh, we have Sergio Langarrica from Sony. He's the Director for International Trade in Sony. He has more than 23 years in Sony in the area of trade compliance and responsible for the foreign trade legal area covering North and South American regions. He's a current national vice president for foreign trade at Caniete Nacional and member of the strategy commission at the Northwest headquarters. Sergio, thank you and welcome. It's an honor to be here. We will start our panel. We will share a slide just to use it as a framework of where our industry is today in, in the TV manufacturing in Mexico. In Mexico, we have 12 companies uh, manufacturing televisions. From there, we have nine in Tijuana. Obviously in the Tijuana, we're, we're considering Hisense, which is in Rosarito, but they're accounted on that number. One in Mexicali, one in San Luis Rio, Colorado, and we have one in Juarez. So we have 12 companies still manufacturing televisions in our country. Uh, the industry employs more than 25,000 uh, employees. In Tijuana, we, uh, we are manufacturing around 30 million of TV sets in the city. The television manufacturing accounts for almost 25%, 24.4% of the total exports in electronics. 
and it's and it has it it is we have three percent of total exports from Mexico are accounted in televisions. One hundred and three million dollars of value added that is created in Mexico with this TV industry. So that's the strength of the industry. Still, it's a leader in Tijuana. And one of the objectives of today's panel is exactly that, to bring back our TV industry to Tijuana. For many years, we were known as the TV capital of the world, and we want to come back and rename our city the display capital of the world. And that's what we're going to be working on. And today we have companies who are leaders in the industry and that we're going to talk with them about the challenges and opportunities in the industry. Helen, we're going to start with you. Helen is going to help us to set up a framework in terms of the tendencies, the new tendencies in value-added supply chain nearshoring that will help us to set up the topics of our conversation today. Helen, please go, go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carlos. Um, okay, so thanks, Carlos, for the opportunity to participate in the panel discussion with industry executives and the regional experts. Uh, thanks, Tijuana EDC, for hosting this event. I want to take this opportunity to share an ongoing industry research project at UC San Diego, uh, named the Post-Globalization Movement to provide a broad background and a framework for today's discussion. So in the next 15 minutes, I will begin with a brief introduction of who we are, followed by the project overview, and end with our initial findings and uh, predictions. About the university, UC San Diego is one of the 10 um, university within the UC California system. Located in San Diego, ranked number eight in top public school, and Rady is within UC San Diego, ranked 12 globally in entrepreneurship. I am the vice chair of the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation, in short, ISEI, uh, hosted by Rady. We are proud of our thought leadership in the value supply chain strategy and uh, innovation empowered by the industry board of advisors and corporate executives worldwide. Here's a little about myself as a business practitioner from the high tech industry through three innovative companies shaped my professional identity. My journey started with Foxconn's large scale manufacturing in Southern California, joined Apple and helped to deliver the first generation of iPhone. After eight years of effort, to expand Apple's global supply chain, I went to Google X, the moonshot factory within Alphabet. I led the mission to design and develop the future value supply chain system. We helped to bring a range of breakthrough technologies to the world, including publicly announced self-driving cars, smart glasses, internet balloon, and energy kites. Centered around today's topic about TV industry, I had remarkable opportunities working with the display industry and all major players during my corporate life. Saying is believing. With 5G AI digitalization transformation and the norm of the virtual world, advanced techno display technology and a broad use of screens will enable a more intelligent future. About our project, the PGM project is led by Dr. Xing and myself. On the one hand, Dr. Xing is the department chair and one of the best professors at Rady. On the other hand, I provide industry experience and the value chain know-how and resources. One month ago, we were invited by the United Nations to share the research findings. Today, due to time constraint, I will only present high level ideas and a summary of our initial findings. We are actually in, entering into the phase two of the research, uh, which is very focused in Mexico and cross-border region, Baja California. So if you're interested to participate and help us on this project, please feel free to contact either me or Dr. Shin. With the globalization and post-globalization topic, 
As when China joined WTO in 2001, I joined Foxconn in 2003. Since then, I have enabled and witnessed the massive transition for outsourcing and offshoring and China's epic growth. Till recent years, when the United Kingdom began to withdraw from the European Union in 2017, when the accumulated trade tension between the US and China turned into a trade war in 2018, when the COVID-19 pandemic exposed hidden risks within the existing value supply chain system, we were forced to pause and reevaluate the vision and the strategy. There is a shift from globalization to something else. Moving forward, the US administration will open the next chapter for the country and the world. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, also called RCEP, between Asia Pacific nations and the new China EU trade deal will bring new dynamics into the global value supply chain system. When virtual meetings became the new norm and in the middle of pandemic, Project PGM was born six months ago. PGM stands for Post-Globalization Movement. It is an industry research project that combines the intellectual powerhouse of research faculty, graduate students, and industry experts within UC San Diego's worldwide community. We hope to incubate future talents by solving the real world problems. I want to mention the methodology a little bit. The 5D, dimension, the 5D dimensional framework was developed to measure regions competitiveness in the context of value supply chain. Four out of five dimensions are to address the business environment. Top line reflects revenue and the company's value proposition driven by customers. Bottom line impacts earnings driven by cost. Hard power includes infrastructure and trade policy managed by countries and governments. People and culture reflect, generate soft power. For each of the dimension, we developed a set of attributes and found third party data and index to quantify the impact. The fifth dimension is time, which is powerful by itself. In other words, companies will solve the same problems with different strategy in terms of short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Based on the 5D framework, our team performed the benchmarking and the SWOT analysis. So let's move on to the phase one research. The biggest problem within the global value supply chain system has been centered around the US and China trade war. Considering the potential impact in terms of market size, population, capacity, for the first phase of the project, we decided to focus on our country, four countries. You can see their national flag on the slide. From left to right, Mexico, US, Mexico, China, and India. With all the background information, we're ready to dive into some details of the phase one project. First of all, we benchmarked the PCBAs. So it's a PCB assembling. It's a landed cost for the bottom line anal analysis. Without tariff, China, India, and Mexico offer comparable prices that are, signif that are significantly lower than the US. However, 25% of tariff turns China's cost higher than the US by 8%. Secondly, the historical data has indicated the labor rate in China have grown more aggressively than the US since 2005, while Mexico mimics the US wage trajectory. We expect a similar pattern going to 2025. Next, we talk about the soft power benchmarking. From left to right, we listed a few attributes to collect data. From top to the bottom, we compared and used a simple color code to explain the relative position of each country. Green means the strongest, red means the weakest. For example, social network is an important attribute of soft power and measured by the number of clusters in top 100. 
The U.S. has 25 clusters, such as Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, and more. China, on the other hand, has 17, such as Shenzhen and Shanghai. India has three, but Mexico has zero. The other example is innovation measured by the Global Innovation Index. The US is leading, followed by China. Mexico and India are comparable. The last example I will use is the critical talent. China is ahead of the US for size of college educated talent pool, which indicates the future. And the US is leading a percentage of adults with college education, which reflects the current status. China is catching up quickly, with both Mexico and India are still far behind. Let's move on to hard power and uh, direct your attention to the first few attributes. Besides the increasing tension between China and the US, China is doing a great job on a number of the trade agreement with other countries. Once we include the most recent RCEP and the China-EU trade deals, China is way ahead of the US. When it comes to quality index, the US has best reputation, followed by Mexico. China and India have less favor favorable reputations. We then analyze the binational relationships. It is important for the North American market. According to 2019 trade data, Mexico is the clear winner. Not only the largest trading partner for the US, but also the least trade deficit. China is the third largest trading partner, but it has the biggest trade deficit, which becomes the source of the trade tension. India is the ninth largest partner with increased tariffs and tension with the US. Here's the takeaway for benchmarking analysis. We have reviewed the bottom line, soft power and hard power. The, take, the key takeaways for the top power, top line is, which on the right, right upper corner, is that Mexico has a unique advantage because of the proximity to the US and North American market. Due to time constraint, I'm not able to share details of the SWOT analysis, which is based on the inputs from industry executives worldwide. What we found is that the qualitative information collected from the industry is very consistent with the quantitative data from index and the literature that I just, represent, I just presented. So what is the phase one conclusion? In the context of the value supply chain, the US is the innovation leader. Mexico represents great trade potential in the North American market. China remains competitive as an all around performer. Finally, India, offers untapped capacity beyond China in Asia Pacific. Well, we're still trying to cope with the COVID. So what's the impact from COVID for the value supply chain? So because COVID exposed the hidden risks from the shortages, anywhere from medical supply to a logistic crisis. So it definitely exposed a lot of risk related to the existing value supply chain. However, it also brought opportunities for tech companies with strong emphasis on IP. In our last symposium in January, 70% people think the pandemic presents more opportunity than risks. I also want to share this findings um, from our industry survey. So, when company make a decisions in terms of the future location, it is a quite complex thinking process. Company executives consider different attributes when they make the location decisions. According to our survey data, soft power including talent, innovation, and a social network 
are the driving force for the headquarters and R&D center. The double circle means here, that's the most important attribute to consider. Cost is still the most important factor for manufacturing, along with other attributes of hard power, such as trade policy and infrastructure. This chart gives a good indication about what it takes to attract high value add investment. Here's the moment that everybody is waiting for. Um, I would like to point out that our conclusion and the predictions uh, consider the following key assumptions that typically out of the control from industry and the companies. We assume similar challenges, conditions, outlook related to trade tension, frictions, and the barriers. We also assume the high risks associated with the climate changes and the pandemic like crisis. So if the company have to consider on the left-hand side, the cost and efficiency is always on top of company's executive's mind. However, COVID has exposed the industry to risks that shortage lack of resilience. But on the other hand, companies also look at the diversification in order to coping with the resilience and the risk associated to it. So the opportunity here is really driven mostly by market related top line factors, which is related to, for example, cost and efficiency can actually resolved by value supply chain clustering. So if all the end to end value supply chain are close to each other, that's what we call clustering and actually could drive and improve cost and efficiency. The resilience on the other side can be resolved by proximity to market. So proximity market represent flexibility, speed, those important attributes that a company are looking for. The diversification uh, can be resolved by regionalization. So in conclusion, the opportunities are mostly driven by the market related top line factors. However, the threat is mostly driven by the hard power concerns. Ellen? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you're up. continuing? You're, you continue, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so based on the uh, assumptions that I mentioned above, and then we're gonna conclude the analysis. So first, while well, China is doing a great job to remain competitive and continuously grow its capacity, the China Plus strategy is happening now and it will continue in the next few years. Southeast Asia will benefit from this rebalancing opportunity. Secondly, our midterm projections lead to Mexico and India. While the business environment is changing more rapidly than ever, these are tough decisions to make. I will discuss further in the next slides about these two country. Lastly, we think the US has a real chance to be one of the long-term contenders for the upstream value supply chain enabled by technology and innovation in partnership with Mexico. About the midterm contenders, because of, of the dominant markets in the US and China, Mexico and India are uniquely positioned to enable the regionalization model. Mexico has a long history and experience of value supply chain system, such as automobile, aerospace, and electronics. It represents, it presents the best choice to improve resilience without sacrificing cost and efficiency. In addition to USMCA, Maclidaras allow companies to capitalize the less expensive labor force in Mexico and they receive benefits of doing business in the United States. What is lacking and must be developed are clusters for social network and the clusters for supply chain systems. Oh, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, in conclusion, compared to the past 20, 25 years of globalization and the free trade conditions, the business environment is more dynamic, complex, and unpredictable than ever. Um, I think when the company has to consider a very complex environment, understand and stay vigilant in trade policies and you know, be aware of the trade tensions. But developing a regionalization model to get closer to their customer is a way to mitigate hard power related risks. 
Finally, the year of 2021 opens a new chapter for all of us. This concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Helen, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, obviously, to have you as a partner with the Tijuana ADC is of much value. We expect to have you in the near future again with us. Your, your approach and your uh, expertise brings a lot of light to what we're, what we're doing. What we're doing in Tijuana is exactly that, how we can take advantage of these new opportunities that we have in the market. We agree with you that COVID generates opportunities. And there's a big opportunity to regionalize, to localize, and that value to our supply chains. So using your presentation as a framework, now we will go to our panelists uh, to discuss uh, and to talk about the TV and display industry. And we have around three questions that, that, that we're gonna throw out to our panelists so they can share their experience and their knowledge with us today. Our, 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 first, our first question, and we're, we're gonna do kind of a SWOT analysis, a, a quick SWOT analysis. So our first question is gonna go focused in terms of our strengths in the industry. So the question is why Tijuana? What are the strengths and benefits that you see in the display manufacturing uh, in Tijuana? Why don't we start, uh, Marco, uh, with you for your initial comments? Sure, thank you, Carlos. I think Helen uh, clearly pointed out that under the COVID uh, crisis that we, we, we felt uh, and we are still feeling is the crisis management, the risk management. And in that regard, being closer to your market becomes a priority. Uh, infrastructure is not a strong uh, area of uh, Mexican industry. However, being near to our client has become a priority because we cannot control the flow of the supply chain. So I think in that regard, Tijuana and Baja California are in a very, very important condition, something that nobody else can compete with us. I, I believe even the north, uh, north part of Mexico, the border of Mexico with the United States is uh, critical area where uh, you will see in the coming years uh, a lot of in, in investment either by Mexican and U.S. companies and also foreign investment. Thank you. Iram, Sergio, please please join in. Edgardo, uh, we will open the mics so you, you can come in with your comments. So <clears throat> I'd like to add in that besides our logistic position in Tijuana, we have a um, great uh, management capability, especially for display business, TV business. We have a uh, technical and administration, great people with experience for 30 years. So other countries doesn't have, doesn't have that experience. For Samsung, I can say that technically we have been same people to Brazil, to Russia, to Germany, to Slovakia, to Hungary, to teach them how to do system and process and how to how to improve it. And besides the management capability, the middle management and the top guys, in case of labor operator. I can say firmly that Tijuana has the best operators of the world. I can compare these operators with Chinese, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Europe, but Tijuana operators, they have big loyalty for companies and they really work with passion, great productivity and amazing quality. Sergio, Edgardo, I think Edgardo wants to participate. Thank you. Uh, what I was gonna say, just reinforce the point. Uh, Ellen mentioned one critical item, which is for the resilience of flexibility and speed. 
is very critical. And um, when we see the evolution of the industry, uh, talking about the display industry, moving also to the larger sizes and, and how fast also we need to respond to any type of uh, uh, specific request in terms of market quality, that becomes quite critical. And I concur with, with Iran from the point of view that the, the talent has been uh, nurtured somehow locally. If we go back when it was mentioned as a capital of the world of the TV, maybe at that time, some of you may remember that we may have potentially to bring talent from other parts of the country when we're talking about some engineering specialties or some technical background. But actually that has been evolving very positively in the past several years. That is giving us the opportunity to have that talent that we need to move from a, what used to be a much more labor intensive type of uh, product to a less labor intensive and now keep growing for some of the technical requirements that we are trying to put in place in terms of innovation for this new trend on the display industry. Thank you. Hello. Sergio, you want to add something? Yes, certainly from a, from a trade policy perspective, I'd like to add first trade agreements Originally NAFTA, which lent a lot of credibility to manufacturing in Mexico and gave preferential tariff treatment to products made in Mexico. So televisions pay either 3.9 or 5% duty into the US, 5% duty into Canada, 15 into Mexico, and anywhere from 6 to 20% in other Latin American countries. Under Mexico's free trade agreements, that duty goes to zero that gives a tangible competitive advantage to manufacturing in Mexico. Second, I'd like to point out the China-US trade wars. In September of 2019, televisions imported from China had to pay, in addition to the 3.9 or 5%, they had to pay 15% additional duty. In February of 2020, that went down to 7.5% which means that Mexico has a tariff advantage of anywhere from 11.5 to 12.5% compared to China, which is the largest competitor into the US market for televisions. So very tangible monetary benefits that we have from trade policy. Those are my comments. Thank you, Sergio. Now uh, we go to the second question, which is more in regards to challenges and opportunities that we see in the industry. And my question to the panel is, what do we need to do to make the industry stronger? We're gonna take two dimensions to this question. Uh, the first dimension of the question will be related to the, to the supply chain standpoint, the, the, the overview on, on related to, to uh, supply chain. And the second uh, standpoint would be the regional content and trade regulations. What areas of opportunity we have on that field? So let's start with supply chain, challenges and opportunities on the supply chain uh, within the industry. Edgardo, would you like to start for us? Uh, sure, thank you, Carlos. Um, I think um, there's a good opportunity. It's a kind of a challenge and at the same time, a good opportunity at the same, uh, at the same time we need uh, to have more vertically integrated material. Uh, it is clear that uh, talking about the, the crystal or the open cell, I think that's gonna remain in Asia. Uh, there's a lot of capacity in that region and that's not gonna change, but uh, putting that aside, uh, there's many other type of components and, and maybe some of the electrical uh, like semiconductor might be a challenge as well, but um, in terms of mechanical, and, and packaging, uh, plastic metal, and, and even some of the optical parts, such as reflection sheets, for example, that is something that if we can develop further more locally, that, that is gonna give us a, a much better advantage for the future. I think that when it used to be the capital of the world, there was a lot of integration, but as, as the industry was changing, several of those suppliers decided to go away. And now we might be facing, in, for some specific components, we might be facing some difficulty trying to, to find the proper source. Uh, there's a, a great opportunity in that regard. 
And I think that also in terms of transportation itself, uh, Ensenada is a critical component in the equation. And especially when we see the difficulties that Long Beach is facing nowadays, we're strongly pushing our sources to shift to Ensenada that I think it has improved by all means in terms of what it used to be several years ago, but it has a still a, a, a real opportunity to be a, a strong contender uh, versus Long Beach to bring even, attract even more uh, some of those uh, uh, shipments from overseas. Thank you. Thank you, Edgardo. Iram? In, in Samsung, I fully agree with Edgardo. In Samsung, we have uh, been moved many uh, income material to Ensenada port. It's not as the same amount of Long Beach, but it's increasing year by year. So about 20 years ago, we had zero from Ensenada, 100% um, overseas material from Long Beach. But nowadays, I can say like 20% um, is not bad. But still, we are trying to get more from Ensenada because Ensenada get a very uh, great uh, contact point to to rapid uh, get the material for suppliers. Samsung style is when Samsung go to some city to establish a manufacturing complex, Samsung uh, got the full package for vertical, vertical integration. But I agree with Edgardo again that uh, if we develop more vendors, more suppliers, uh, we can make greater competition for big parts like mechanicals, uh, metals and plastic, but also optic is getting very, very important business. So for investor are welcome and we are waiting for them. Thank you, Iram. Um, Marco, uh, Sergio, if, if, any, if you want to jump in to the conversation, please. Sure. Um, I just would like to uh, re-emphasize re what Edgardo uh, previously mentioned about flexibility and speed. And in that regard, I think that the, the supplier chain uh, and the vertical, vertical integration that Iman mentions uh, has to come in, in, with this flexibility and speed. We, we cannot uh, sacrifice the, our customers' requirements, our time constraints that we have, uh, because the, supplier, the, the suppliers will not adapt to this speed of the industry, which is something that has developed very, very, very much if we compare it to 15, 20 years ago. And, and to that point, I think that the government of Mexico needs to focus on supporting this industry. The development of the vertical integration is not just the job of uh, companies like Samsung or Foxconn or, or Hisense. It has to have the support of the federal government to create uh, grants, to create uh, uh, innovation grants that can support this industry. Otherwise, this industry will not be able to survive uh, this environment that Edgardo just mentioned, which is a, a very, very competitive environment where the suppliers need to adapt very, very fast. Thank you, Marco. Sergio, I would like to, to uh, focus with you in relation to supply chain related to content value and how, how, you, how the reinforcement of that supply chain creates more competitiveness in terms of, of tariffs going to the US. Certainly. The philosophy within the electronics industry has generally, generally or historically been one of globalization and flexibility. And Helen clearly highlighted how that's been changing to one of regionalization. 
So the electronics industry, many of the components already come from Asia. We built into the first NAFTA and now USMCA flexibility with regards to you know, where you're sourcing the components and focused on, that, on what components and what happened to happen in the region, acknowledging the need to be able to bring components from all over the world, but predominantly Asia. That level of flexibility was great when we were in the CRT world, when it shifted to flat panel screens, the dynamics changed. There's a lot of new players. There's a lot of new companies that actually attracted a lot of investment into Mexico. But then we had a dichotomy. We had on the one hand, companies that thought and were vertically integrated and suppliers around them to newer companies with newer investments that had lesser degrees of integration, lesser degrees of investment, which were predominantly bringing much more components from Asia. What we saw was a significant decrease in suppliers and personnel within Mexico. So right now we have about 25,000 people estimated. In the early 2010s or late 2010s, we had a roughly around the same amount of direct employment. That dropped and about 2014, that dropped to about 15,000 direct employees. We saw that companies were closing and people were being laid off and that the landscape had gotten extremely competitive with a strong focus on cost being driven by the importation of higher levels of assembly coming predominantly from Asia and China. That actually led to a high degree of friction within the industry in Mexico and the need for the Mexican government to get involved. So the, the trade agreement gave us flexibility but it turned into an imbalance within Mexico. That internal war led to the establishment of certain manufacturing requirements or manufacturing basis in order to be able to continue operating in Mexico and use the trade agreements. That problem is, that program is known as Regla Octava and it is a supplier related program, which after tough negotiations with the government was ultimately focused on the manufacture of certain types of components. Printed circuit board assemblies, the flat panel screen assembly, metal parts, plastic parts, packaging. The focus again was on parts. So that was implemented around 2014, 2015, 2016 when those negotiations occurred. But again, the industry has changed. And what did we see? We saw that Mexico could continue to maintain competitiveness in larger size screens, but was losing with regards to lower or smaller size screens. So we had this imbalance because it wasn't cost competitive. So what we have been trying to do as an industry led by the Electronics Industry Association, Canieti, has been to find ways to create policy to work with the government so that we don't fall back into that scenario where we're losing competitiveness, we're losing suppliers, we're losing jobs, but to help strengthen the vertical chain in Mexico. Some of the ideas um, center around the concept of value added. Actually, the new requirements under the UMCA for televisions and displays in particular focus on two options, whether it be final assembly of the finished good or at least 50% regional value content in Mexico, recognizing that sub-assemblies become Mexican goods, recognizing that we still need to import many components. But the current policies don't favor or don't consider what is investments in industry 4.0, the automation of manufacturing, the use of artificial intelligence, software, uh, as part of manufacturing and even as part of the use of the finished goods that we're producing. So what we need to do, and the opportunity coming out of these challenges that I've just listed, is we need to find how to modify these policies in order to, one, consider investment. When you come into a country and you put money into investing in factories, that money should count and counts ultimately towards your cost of production. That concept is included in the regional value cost calculations within the US, USMCA, which is the basis of the policies that we're considering. Two, innovation in R&D. We've seen that factories, some factories, some companies have been moving in that direction of having R&D, but there's no incentive to do it. 
So if we can include R&D and the costs associated with R&D, even if they are indirect cost manufacturing of that television, set us up for future production and give, it a, give us a competitive edge. The same thing with industry 4.0 and investing in automation and uh, the newest manufacturing standards. So we see as the next step is we need to go back and work with the government in order to rethink the policies that we created, move away from a focus only on make sure you're mounting the board and take a more holistic approach where we're looking at software, automation, industry 4.0, investment, and how that should be also considered in order to help us drive the strength of the industry. Those are my comments. Thank you, Sergio. And uh, using your comments as a framework, uh, I, will ask, I would like to ask uh, our other panelists, the, what do we need in terms of trade regulations? You, you talk a little bit about it, uh, Sergio, in your comments, but maybe Marco, who also is involved in this topic, is what do we need? What are the opportunities in, in, in terms of trade regulations within Mexico? What needs to change or what do we need to do to support the industry in a better way? Well, I think that uh, Helen already uh, put it in, in her slides. The Maquiladora, which is now the EMEX program, is an opportunity, it's a strength for Mexico. And what Mexico has to do is it has to update it. It has to be, uh, has to use it properly to continue to be a driving force for investment, for investment specifically. Uh, I think that there's a great opportunity for the federal government and, uh, and this uh, second period of, of the current government to review and update and be more flexible. I think one of the uh, weakest issues that we felt last year was that the program of EMEX was very slow when companies, new investments were coming in and they wanted to uh, approve their permit. So I think that using, as, for, as Sergio mentioned, technology, must be an, a, a priority for the federal government so that we can have a, an EMEX program that enables innovation and enables investment here in Tijuana. Thank you. Uh, Edgardo, Iram, any, any comments? Um, if, if I may, uh, somehow, but I think what Sergio mentioned is, is quite important in terms of Somehow we need to reinvent the industry. What I mean by that is the, the transformation itself or, or how to measure the transformation level shouldn't be necessarily in terms of how much labor resource is put in place to create the display or the TV. It should also, of course, that, that's a critical factor by all means, but it should also consider other items associated with the technology, the innovation, and, and if the, the, there should be a motivation also for the companies to start trying to find the proper balance for the automation, one for the AI uh, of what we are producing. Uh, I think what used to be a very labor intensive now is not necessarily, uh, or we should start thinking how to have more technical oriented talent that still of course is going to is going to require a good pool of resources in terms of direct labor but how we can nurture more aggressively that engineering knowledge so the transformation itself to consider that type of value added and and when ellen was mentioning what what is the value proposition of the company part of the value proposition should be precisely how to contribute to the transformation from other perspective of the product itself, software development and, and more prediction when the AI and the IoT is put in place, that should help us to be more, <clears throat> to have a more predictable process. Uh, so by putting that in place, how, how we can have that type of incentive also from the federal government to keep moving in that direction. Thank you, Edgardo. Thank you. Iram? 
So <clears throat> the point the point of maquilador industry, uh, especially in Baja and Tijuana, is uh, the employment offered and demand. The automation and robotic in our business factories, it has to be for never for replace the production operator to help them instead of help and support. In Samsung, the philosophy is robotic is for to do functions and activities that operators, they don't want to do it. Or it is unsafe to operators. Or they don't feel comfortable. For example, in terms of do inspection to one TV or one uh, display uh, device, some operator can get tired from the eyes within the working hours. But we can do a robot that, they, that the robot can do that function. That kind of automation is welcome in Samsung. When we packing the TV set, especially large screen size over 65 inch, even 55 inch, we can use a, a mechanical arm to do that activity. So operators, they don't get tired to take the bags and package the product. That is the way that in Samsung uh, use robotic and automation. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, Dom. Thank you. And we, we're we're gonna we're gonna go to to our last quick question, and it's gonna be a, a quick. Uh, uh, we're gonna go through our panelists very quickly. Uh, so we can have time for some questions from our from our audience. Um, and the question is, what do we see in the near future or in the in the TV industry? What's next? Uh, quick ideas. Uh, if if please jump in, uh, whoever wants to start. Uh, quick idea. So what's next, Miram? So. Next is now. Uh, TV business is moving to display business. And that doesn't start tomorrow and today. It starts since a few years ago. I can say three years ago. I would like to share, just for example, behind me, I put this intention, intentionally. This is a frame TV. This TV, Besides to be TV, but you can broadcast the local channels, um, the smart TV, Netflix, Disney, Disney Plus, you can hook up, you can connect with museums around the world to download the pictures. And you can get as a frame. And you can put uh, the function to every few minutes change to another frame. And I would like to share this image. If you allow me. This is um, amazing surround display. This display is, is, is installing now in the Rams Stadium, the biggest stadium of football in the world. Perhaps. Can you see this huge and gigant display? This display is making and was making in Tijuana, Mexico. So this is the, the trend of this industry. TV is becoming more and more display device. And near the fissure will be even for transparent displays. And in Baja, we have no other choice to adapt this technology and manufacturing here. Thank you. 
Edgardo, Marco. Sure. Uh, I would like to follow up on what Iram just mentioned. Uh, definitely, we live in a society that's visual. And in that regard, what used to be the TV industry, uh, and, and as Hiram mentioned, it's now a display industry. And, and I remember a few years back when my phone was five inches, the display. Now everybody wants a bigger display. And I think in that regard, and, and Hiram just mentioned the displays that the stadium of the Rams in LA has. So larger is the trend and that will not stop. And the industry is moving in that direction. So I think that a connected lifestyle through visual displays, it's, it's the now, it's what we just, Miran just mentioned. We are living that, that development as we are talking right now. And the opportunity for that is for the industry to um, innovate and specifically as we started at, at the beginning of this uh, forum, talent development. I think that Edgardo and I'm already mentioned that the industry is a very mature industry. There's a lot of talent, there's a lot of expertise. And in that regards, I think that we have to understand that the investment that's coming right now is from a different country. And in that regards, there's a cultural shift that we have to understand. And I think that we have the, the strength and the experience to adapt very fast to that uh, different culture of doing business. By what I mean is there's a investment coming from China, there's investment coming from other countries, not just from Japan and Korea, that was the trend a few years back. And Mexico and specifically Tijuana management, as Iran mentioned, has the experience to be very fast adapting to the requirements uh, that these cultures bring into this business style. Thank you, Marco. Edgardo? Um, yeah, I think uh, when, when we just, um, when we just have the TV as a, as a product, I think we all agree that the cosmetic difference sometimes is, some of you as consumers, you go to the store and generally speaking, you may not see a dramatic difference among the TVs. Uh, of course, once you, you may have a more uh, expert eye, you will start seeing more and more differences and that is okay. But generally speaking, I think what is gonna be the, the, the challenge for the future is gonna be more in terms of connectivity. And of course, how to utilize uh, and connectivity talking about we're gonna to move to 5G and then the 8K is, is coming, but also how to be more into the, the, the in many ways the fine tuning or the differences happening among the different TVs, maybe reciting, of course, the, the panel, whether it's OLED or it's regular LCD, is definitely that is one of them. But the other one is what is part of the SOC, which is the, the heart of the, of the TV in terms of software uh, and differentiation, technical uh, uh, programming as part of the, what we call the SOC, which is the, the, the main uh, uh, you know, component of the main board. I think uh, more and more trend in that direction and how we can be prepared or the industry can be prepared also for that. It's not gonna be so much about the mechanical solution per se, I think. Of course, there's a frameless and there's some other uh, points of uh, bending the panel, which is exciting. Uh, I'm not sure how much is gonna be a, a general uh, perception, but what I just mentioned is yes, more than the TV is for the display industry, how to, you, how to be more into the new technology trend in, for connectivity per se, I think. Thank you, Edgardo, for your comments. Thank Sergio. You. I think those are excellent comments made, made by Edgardo. Um, more and more, and COVID is, is certainly advanced this, is we live in a virtual society. Right? I mean, we're looking at each other through screens. We've seen, as a result of COVID, an increase in production and sales of televisions and display. It's a trend that has been accelerated. 
uh, and it's not just a uh, one way anymore it's two way so and and it's not and it's everywhere it's become ubiquitous it's whether it's in your hand it's your laptop or the screens in your home or now we see technologies you know where where you build walls made up of screens and we see this in professional development creation of movies um even even virtual concerts right, where the backdrop is now the screen so we have many more applications than we had before we have a world that is much more virtual and you know in in technology silicon valley you always hear about how digitization or digital technologies are transforming industries and i think automotive is a huge trend right now and you see the use of displays in the motor automotive industry now very different than the electronics industry you know within the trade agreements and within a lot of national government policies television i mean automobile production is highly regional and the requirements that i've always seen whenever i've done studies with regards to the transportation industry is that and usmca is, is a, an example of that rates as high as 72 percent regional value content to gain the benefits so the automotive industry for their global and regional production strategies is now incorporating more displays into the automobiles and they need suppliers with capability and technology to be able to help them produce those products so i think we're strategically placed within the north american region in order to take advantage and to further develop alliances with other sectors that now require the use of displays in their products even in tijuana there's a huge trend towards uh, biomedical devices even the biomedical devices require screens and require certain capabilities that we can work locally you know we have toyota locally we have we have many other automotive companies that are that are starting to come so the question is how do we taking that example of digitalization and how digital is transforming many other industries how do we consider it from the perspective of displays what capabilities do we have and or need to develop you know what integrations do we need to do with automotive biomedical professional industries in order to become to diversify our production and to increase what we're doing today within the region. Those are my comments. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you all. Uh, we're we're going to go uh, to questions and answers uh, to the Q and A uh, part of, the, of our of our panel. Uh, we are, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is from Juan Diaz from CETIS, and this is a question to our panelists. What are the soft and or hard skills that future professionals looking to get involved in the electronic electric industry must have or develop? Um, I'd like to share, I think that the United States has a very uh, uh, particular word that we, we always uh, have difficulty translating into Spanish, which is accountability. It's something that I think that uh, the newest generation has to have. They have to have results. The industry is a fast paced moving industry and we cannot have just good ideas. We have to have people, talented people that can have innovation as, as Helen mentioned. I think we are an innovative industry and it, there's a balance between good ideas, innovative ideas, but they have to be, to be put in, in actions and they have to have results. The new generations have to understand this. They have to be accountable and they have to provide fast results. Uh, if I can jump in, um, aside from the soft, uh, soft skill that uh, Marco just mentioned, I think, uh, and we, we already mentioned that uh, optical engineering is a critical, critical factor uh, to keep developing. Uh, developing locally. Uh, we, we do have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, optical engineering 
is an opportunity area, uh, I think. And also, we've been mentioning or we've been talking about the, the IoT and how, but we can, many, many people might be using AI, IoT, generally speaking, but I think the challenge that we have is how, how to do a, a practical connection with the manufacturing operation. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, from an application point of view, industrial engineering point of view, how the IoT can help improve the manufacturing operation. Uh, there's uh, many predict, uh, uh, I had the opportunity once to be, for example, at Rockwell in Ohio, and, and what they had in one of the SMT machines is with this analysis of information that the SMT machine was collecting, they were being able to determine by when the nozzle that was placing the components in the equipment based on an historical trend, behavior, et cetera, et cetera, they were able to predict by when maybe that nozzle was gonna be failing again. And therefore the purchase order to bring that nozzle was put in place beforehand. So that type of real application for manufacturing operation is, is an opportunity. I think in general, we are trying to, we're trying to do as much as we can, let's say at, at the industry level, but uh, that's, that's something that we can nurture furthermore, maybe with some of the uh, educational institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to, to uh, another, we have other questions. Uh, next question is how important, this is for, from Carolina Fernandez, uh, how important is it to implement cybersecurity in the TV industry in terms of software automation employees? Is it a challenge that needs to be faced in Mexico or in the industry in general? Now, right now, it's not a big issue, but soon it will be. Because as few years ago, we came with the digital convergence. Now we will come with the smart convergence. So the TV will become more and more like PC. For example, right now, in the pandemic, pandemic time, we do video conference face-to-face, -face, just like uh, we are doing now. But uh, near the future, the TV will have capability to do Zoom conference. And that will be amazing because it's not one person to one person. It will be one family to one family. Or just thinking in this way, in the kitchen, somebody is uh, cooking something and his mother in another city are cooking the same things and they can work and interact and talk without putting the face in the, in the monitor. So at that time, the security of the software in the TV will be a big issue. Here we have a field and great opportunities for the software engineering to start to work in that process. Well, uh, that is not my expertise area in any shape or form, but I think cybersecurity is extremely important nowadays for any connected devices. Uh, I mean, even in TV, you may be putting your credit card information to purchase something online, even on your TV and uh, of course, the cybersecurity remains to be or should be as one of the top priorities for, for the designers when they are creating the product. Definitely is something that should be taken care of very, very cautiously by all means. And we're gonna to go to our last question. Um, it comes from Emmanuel Mejia. And his question is, is there any innovation in the electronic television sector with preserving the environment?
Hi, this is Sergio. Uh, Sony has uh, environmental policies in place called green policies, and we've signed international accords. And that means uh, stopping the usage of certain types of chemicals. It means considering the sustainability of the parts components used in Sony product. It incorporates also, and, and even from a government perspective, we see a lot of regulations with regards to the recycling of e-waste. So definitely we, we cooperate in those types of initiatives. And the um, environmental impacts of e-waste are, are significant, and those are initiatives going around the world. And those are issues that Sony itself is thinking of as well. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Um, I think we, we are uh, we are already meeting our time quota. So we're going to finish our panel uh, at this moment. We would like to thank our panelists, Helen, Sergio, Marco, Edgardo, Iram. Thank you very much for your time. We at the Tijuana ADC, uh, we will focus in supporting the industry. Obviously on the supply chain idea, in, in working, in bringing suppliers to the region and support your operations and also work with colleges to create the talent that is required and also help in the lobbying with the public officials to bring more support to the industry and bring back and, and hopefully uh, bring Tijuana again now as a display capital of the world. That's what we want. We were once and we can come back again. Thank you for all our participants. Thank you for the people that followed us through our uh, social networks through Zoom. We will see you soon. Muchas gracias a todos.